So what we're going to look at today is a couple of assumptions we make. We make a lot of assumptions in life. You know, some of them are simple, some of them are complex. But perhaps the most fundamental assumptions we make are about our own existence, our, our own identity. Now, Descartes, he's famous for trying to take it down to its root and say that I can only assume my own existence because I, since I think, I must exist. But in general, we go beyond this and start to make other assumptions about our identity, about our existence, that possibly are unfounded. And when, when we have these unfounded, unreasoned assumptions, it makes it difficult for us to ask other important questions. For example, if you don't know who you are, how can you know whether you have free will? How can you know what your purpose in life is? And how can you know what it is to die if you don't know what your own existence is in the status quo? So today, what I'm going to do first is look at a couple of assumptions we make about our identity, four of them particularly, and look at why they might not actually be who we are. And then we'll propose a couple of possibilities for what our identity could actually be. Now, I don't promise that I'll actually let you know better who you are, but hopefully you'll leave here with more questions than answers. So first off, about these assumptions we have, I think that we assume our identity in a number of ways. We probably say, I am my body, since your body follows you throughout your life, or I am my mind, because my mind kind of controls my body. And I am my experiences, because those are the things which we define ourselves by, I, the people you marry, et cetera. And I might even say that I am my thoughts, because that's kind of the, the, the most fundamental level of how you interact with the world, how you think. But the problem is, these aren't necessarily empirically you. First, when you're looking at the idea of being your body or not, I'd say that in terms of, in, in terms of existence, I'd say that any entity that we are has to be indivisible. You couldn't add to it or subtract from it, otherwise that would be changing it in some fundamental way. So if we're going to be the same person throughout our life, the problem with the body is that we could remove parts of the body and we would still be our same eye. You can see the picture here. If you removed your arms and legs, you're still the same person. You're the same name, you're the same experiences, you're the same, everything that you define your, about yourself by still exists. Now, I think particularly you can see this even with, with paralysis. No matter what, either way you're changing when you lose a hand, you know, you're not going to be able to interact with the world the same way. Um, or when you are paralyzed, there's uh, definitely changes in your life, particularly even emotionally you can change because there's no uh, peripheral nervous system to interact with, so there's no reciprocal, uh, basically, emotions that start in your brain, your body responds to them, and it can cause a cycle. Uh, and so since you don't have this same cycle interacting with the peripheral nervous system, you change your emotions. But even though you're changing in these symptomatic ways, the identity that you are as an entity is still a singular entity that can't be defined by these changes. So if you're to say that our existence is whatever identity we are is indivisible, and the body can be cut out of it, then we'd have to say that we aren't our body. Now, something that I think a lot of people end up going to is that our brain is, is who we are, because our brain is what controls our body. Our brain has this control, and in fact, you know, it's probably the most important organ in our body. But again, if we're going to cross-apply this idea that it can't be divided away, we've got a problem because the brain, any single part of the brain, could be taken out and you would still exist as the same eye. A couple of examples of this, if you look, Phileas Gange is historically famous because he survived having a spike blown up through his head, which removed a large chunk of his frontal lobe. And uh, miraculously, he survived, yet after this experience, he was the same person, even though he'd lost this huge chunk of his mind, this huge part of this important organ that allows him to control his body. And so if you're to say that he's the same person, and I think that people would be a little bit, he'd be mad if you're like, no, you are no longer Phileas Gange. You're going to have to admit that that part of his brain and perhaps other parts of his brain were not actually who he was. Um, this actually becomes even more clear when you take a look at uh, the anterior siglotomy, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but this, uh, this pr procedure is done in a couple of research hospitals in Massachusetts, and what they notice is that people who have really extreme forms of OCD, uh, one, one case was a woman who she had to swallow anything she saw and they would get stuck in her throat, R really, really bad form of OCD, and they actually go in and they burn out chunks of her brain, and they manage to you know, correct this psychological disorder, and afterwards I'd say that she would still say she's the same identity, that she's still the same person, and these parts of her brain that were divided away mean that, again, our brain is not who we are. Now, if we're not our body and not our brain, this leaves us, okay, so what can we be? It leaves us more ephemeral. And I think that experiences are something that we start to define ourselves by, the successes and failures in our life. But fundamentally, I find another problem with that uh, at the base level, that if we define ourselves by experiences, then it becomes very ephemeral. If you look at the 
two baseballs. Is a baseball more of a baseball after it's been thrown in a baseball game? I think, uh, again, are we more or less of a human because we you know, are younger and haven't had experiences? I would say not. So because of that, I think it's just on its fundamental level, you would not want to define yourself by your experiences. But the second problem we have in terms of defining ourselves by our experiences is that we don't have clean access to our historical experiences. Uh, Particularly Ledux, he was a uh, he was a researcher uh, in uh, in basically medicine, and he came up with this uh, with this basically enzyme inhibitor that, which prevents proteins from forming, which create memories. And he found through some research, and I'll explain the study in a moment, that our memories actually change every time we access them. Now, the, the way he found this out is he took a series of uh, a group of mice and he he taught them to fear a couple of sounds like beep and boop, and he, he, he would play these sounds right before he would shock them. Not very nice, of course, but you know they, he, it was the only way that he could find out what these mice were thinking. And so he'd shock them right after he played these sounds, and so the mice would you know, all cringe up whenever they heard this sound. Now he waited a couple months, you know, to try and make sure that they had learned this, and then he took those same mice and he took half of them and he injected them with this uh, this inhibitor, which prevents the formation of new memories while they were hearing this sound. And what he noticed is that after they had gone through this therapy, they no longer feared the sound. Because what happens is that they hear this sound, they go back into their brain and say, okay, this sound means I'm going to be you know, shocked. But they look at that memory and it is broken down. It's broken down every time you look at it. But since it can't be rebuilt because his inhibitor prevents the proteins from forming, they never had the memory again. So this means in our real life, every time we access a memory, we're breaking that memory down physically and recreating it in our mind. And we're not always doing it perfectly. We're going to have cross application of different ideas in our mind and a, a thousand different little mistakes that occur. You all know you don't remember everything, and even when you remember things, you remember them incorrectly. And so if you're going to find yourself by your experiences, even if you accept that experiences are really who you are, you're going to have a problem because you don't have a clean access to that. You can never know really who you are because you don't have a memory to record those things completely accurately. Now, the final area that we're going to see is that if we're not our mind or our body, or our experiences, then I think the last bastion of our identity would perhaps be our thoughts. You know, that's what you're sitting out there right now thinking. But the problem with our thoughts is that they often come exogenously. What I'm going to look at is that for something to be you, I would say that you would have to have like always had it or developed it by yourself. But thoughts actually come extrinsically from our environment, particularly if you look back to like early childhood development. Um, babies, you know, when they're when they're really young, they they have really no autonomy, no idea of self. In fact, they, there's common problems where they'll you know they'll they'll be bothered by something, you know, and they'll they'll start crying, and then they get annoyed by the crying, and they're just like, what is that noise? What is that noise? And they don't even know that they're the ones crying, causing this problem. <laughs> and, and and so it's a serious problem. It's a serious problem. But uh, what we see what we see here is that you know there's we start off at this level of of complete lack of self-control, complete lack of identity. And the way that we actually start to develop our identity comes largely from the people we interact with, particularly our parents. Um, in terms of early childhood development, like when, uh, when we want to learn what a square is, you know, our, our mother goes and says, hey, you know, see this puzzle and there's four points and equidistance lines and they're like, see, now you can put it into that thing. And early children take this exogenous information and they don't encode it properly in their mind normally. And so when they go and get tested later on, they often have to verbalize, uh, verbalize exactly what their mother said. So they're thinking in their mind, mommy said, says that a square has four points in this and therefore this is the correct answer. They're not saying, I think this. It's only after time after time after time of saying, mommy says this, mommy says this, that eventually we start to encode it as our own thoughts, our own ideas, when in fact it's simply basically an illusion of our own existence of thoughts. Um, and I think another important aspect of this is how language comes, uh, comes to play in terms of our, our access of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, there was an interesting case, a, a group of illegal immigrants came across the United States and they had a genetics disorder which caused them, uh, uh, like three or four of them, to be born deaf. And since they didn't have access to schools and money and such, they, they never were taught language, sign language. And so they, they grew up and basically developed their own form of miming in order to try and interact. Um, one of these children was taken um, by his uncle to a to a sign language, American Sign Language class at college, and uh, he was 20 some years old. And uh, over the course of months, uh, one of the students there sat and helped him trying try to teach him. Now he was confused for a long time because she would mime a he, she would do a sign and he would just mime it back because that was what his language was. But eventually he he had a breakthrough and she was able to teach him American Sign Language. Uh, months later, after he had developed a, a, a decent vocabulary and such, they approached him and, and asked him what it was like to be without language, and he said he physically could not remember existing without language. All of those thoughts were so fundamentally different, so not his, 
that his identity had shifted over that. So if we look at this and we see these, these ideas, these thoughts that are in our head as coming exogenously, not coming from us, and being defined by languages that, that we that shift and cause us not to think the same way, it's questionable whether these thoughts that you're having right now are even your own or simply kind of a hive mind that's developed over generations and generations. So it's not terribly comfortable at this point. I could leave you and just say, well, you're, you're nothing. You know, you, you don't exist. <laughs> uh, but we're going to try. We're going to try and move forward and try and come up with a couple possibilities that are a little more comfortable. And there's three that I'm going to present. And you can make your own opinions on which ones uh, you think are correct, or maybe even try and develop your own. But the first one is that Descartes is wrong. We don't exist. Obviously not very happy, but I think that the picture to the side of this actually is pretty interesting. It's a, uh, it's a picture by Robert Rotsberg, um, and, it's, and it's his attempt to erase William de Kooning. William de Kooning was a famous contemporary uh, modern artist, and he went to him and he, he had a picture. He asked for a picture from him, and he, and he just erased it over the course of months. And uh, I think just looking at it, it's, it's a really interesting concept of, of not existing, because that's you know this, this void to take something and remove it um, is not a particularly comfortable thought. And so the one reason why I don't embrace this concept are twofold, I guess. One, experientially, I kind of like Descartes' the logic that I think therefore I exist. And two, honestly, I don't want to go through life thinking I don't exist. But make your own choices on that one. <laughs> now, the second idea that I think is going to be something that, uh, in fact, a lot of people, I think, embrace. And that's the idea that uh, we have some sort of extra dimensional existence, perhaps something like a soul, I think, would be what, what most people would call it. Um, and what I want to look at is why this is actually more possible. It's not simply some, like, you know, floating around and, like, weird mythological idea. Dimensionally, it is possible for two entities to remain in the same space. Particularly, if we take a look at this picture, what I'm trying to present is the idea that a shadow, a two-dimensional object, can exist in the same space as a three-dimensional object of a chair. And that's the same thing that applies in our case. Now, basically, what we see in terms of dimensions is since we can have two-dimensional objects and three-dimensional objects occupying the same space, they exist on completely different planes, then we could infer that a three-dimensional object and a fourth-dimensional object could also occupy the same space. And so if we embrace the concept that, that these dimensions can independently occupy any single space, then it makes sense that we could physically exist as an extra dimensional object that we can't have experiences with. So again, this is not empirically proving that we have a soul, but it says that there are reasons to believe that we could have a soul. Now, the final example that I think is possible for who, how we exist is simply Kurt Vodigan's uh, idea that we only exist in infinitely finite moments. Uh, I, ideally, every change that we've, we see in our body, whether we remove a hand or whatever, that actually changes the entity that we are. And only in these infinitely finite sections of, of the universe, whatever we are, do we exist. Now, this actually has a lot of research which points to it as actually being possible. Particularly, what I'm going to look at is the idea of time. And the fact is that if time can exist in two different moments at the same time, so if we've got two objects that are in two different moments in time, then that would mean that the entirety of the universe would essentially have to exist simultaneously at the same moment. And, well, different mode, and then it's at the same time. To make it a little bit clearer, if you look at a couple of, uh, of examples of why we can know that time exists at two different moments, basically two objects existing in two different times at the same moment, well, you can look at GPS satellites and the Haldron Collider. Now, with GPS satellites, we, we know these things are floating around our, our Earth. They're going at like 11,000 miles per hour, something along that. And they happen to be further from gravity. These two things, based on you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, imply that they're going to move through time actually at a different rate from us. And we actually see this in, in, in truth because for these GPS satellites to be accurate, we actually have to alter their clocks up in, in space by about like 0.2 picoseconds every single day. Otherwise, our GPS satellites wouldn't be accurate because if we don't know where they are in time, then when they do their triangulation, we don't end up having accurate information because it's the distance that lasers travel and such. So this actually sees, we can see satellites floating around our atmosphere that are moving through time at a different rate from us. Now, a second example we see with this is the Haldron Collider. They basically speed up little particles as fast as they can. And they've found that, we know particularly, that a lot of different particles have a specific rate of decay. And in the Haldron Collider, they put in these particles that they know their rate of decay, and they sped them up to like 99% of the speed of light. And what they found is as they approached the speed of light, the rate of decay of these objects changed, these molecules. And so what this means, again, is that we, relative to those molecules, we're moving through space at a different time. So if we're going to say that, you know, let's say time is a, a track that we're running on, and we've got two different runners, one being the GPS satellites and one being us, 
we are running at two different rates and one's getting ahead of each other. And so time has to exist at two points on that track. And that means the whole track that is time, the eternity of time, would essentially have to exist. And each moment on that track would be the entirety of the universe existing. So that's, if you've read Kurt Vonnegut, is kind of the basis of his, uh, of his Slaughterhouse Five. And it, and it actually has functional mathematical proof that it could possibly be the case. And in fact, this is the one that I feel most comfortable with. So today we've looked at a number of things. We've pointed out why we might not be our body, we might not be our mind, we might not be our experiences or our thoughts. And we've, we've seen a couple of possibilities for what we could be. And honestly, I don't know. But I, 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 do know, I do know that we need to ask these questions because if we don't know who we are, then we can't ask these other questions, these things that are really important for how we decide what we do in life, how we live our lives, how, how we face death how we choose to affect, it, uh, affect mortality. So hopefully you can go forward and come up with your own ideas for how you exist. Thank you.